Okay, I want you to open your Bibles this morning to Genesis chapter 29 and verse 16. We got a little bit of Genesis 29 in last time, but we're going to get a major dose of it this morning. Now, actually, in order to synchronize verse, let, let's, let's, let me put it this way. Let's start with verse 14, and that kind of goes back into what we've studied already and brings us into where we're going to be this evening, or excuse me, this morning. So, verse 14 and Laban said to him, that would be Jacob, Surely you are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And he stayed with him a month. Now, this is what's happened is Jacob made a 500-mile trek to see his family that they had not seen, his, the, the rest of his family, in 97 years. And when he got there, his mission was to find a wife because his father Isaac told him to go there to find a wife, someone uh, where his family was located. And so when he got there, we went over these verses already. Uh, it was similar to what we see in uh, Genesis chapter 24 when Isaac sent a servant to Actually, it was Abraham that sent the servant to find a wife for Isaac, which was Jacob's father. It was the same place, and very similar things happened that brought us to the point where we're here. And now uh, he, they're going to have a big feast because, of course, this, they're going to celebrate uh, this, this revival here, or renewal. And then in verse 15 it says, Then Laban said to Jacob, because you are my relatives, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me what shall be your wages, or what shall your wages be? Now, in order to understand that, there's something that's missing here that most people don't understand. And that it was the custom in that time that if you go to visit someone, you stay with them three days, and you just take care of all their needs. But after three days, they would start working for you. I think that's a pretty good idea. <laughs> uh, you probably have a lot of guests that would stay three days and then have to leave. I don't know. But in any case, um, so he stayed with him a month, if you'll notice in verse 14. And he stayed with him a month. And that would mean that after three days, Jacob started working for Laban to, to pay his way. And after a month... Then we have Laban saying, let's talk about your wages. <laughs> Do you see something a little uh, fishy there? He worked for him a month, and then Laban brings up wages. And that, who, it, that is who Laban was, because he was the uh, king of chiselers. He was a con man and a charlatan. Of course, that was describing Jacob as well. He had already deceived and done a lot of foul things. He had to get out of Todd because they were after him. And so he was just what my dad used to call a piker. Have you ever heard of that term? It's a piker. I never was for sure what that meant, but it meant he was a novice. He was an amateur compared to Laban when it came to cheating and deceiving people. And as this, these verses unfold, you're not going to believe how good he was at uh, cheating people. And this is just the first volley here. This is the first shot after a month. But now let's talk about your wages. And by the way, throughout this, you'll see that what, uh, Laban is going to talk about wages more than one time. Uh, but that's all he did was talk. He never did pay anything, which we'll see. Okay, now, verse 16. Now, Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the 
younger was Rachel. Verse 17, and Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful from form and face. Let's just stop there for a moment. I'm not sure what it means when it says her eyes were weak. Leah, she was the older one. It, it might mean that she couldn't see very well and, and you know, would bump into things or something. Or it could be that she had kind of uh, dull kind of eyes. I mean, some people and have more sparkling eyes and maybe one of their better features is their eyes. And that goes especially with women. And so it could be that uh, Rachel had uh, better looking eyes than Leah did or could be talking about her entire uh, person. That uh, what well, it says that uh, Rachel was beautiful in face and form. And so... Uh, that sets up something that is very normal in relationships because there's going to be problems in the relationship when you have the older daughter is common and the younger daughter is a knockout. And in that time, as we're going to see, it was customary for the older daughter to get married first. And so... Laban is going to reach into his bag of tricks and he's going to show Jacob what deception is really all about because he's a master at it. Even though Jacob was pretty good, he was still a novice. Verse 18. Now, Jacob loved Rachel, so he said... I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. So what's going on here is he asked, Laban's asking about wages, and he said, I will work seven years for you if you give me your daughter, Rachel. Now, I have a few points here. I guess I'll just give them in numbered uh, way so you can be easy to organize them. Point number one. It's no surprise that Jacob fell for Rachel and not for Leah. It seems some things never change. And, of course, you would expect that because that is reality. We're talking about beauty. We're talking about looks, which really is no big deal or should be no big deal. But when it comes to relationships between males and females, it is a huge deal, is it not? Now, I understand we are attracted to people for different reasons. And, and the first thing when you meet somebody, what do you notice? What do they look like? Are they tall? Are they short? Are they fat? Are they thin? Do they have, uh, a, a, are they nice looking? Are they not dead gorgeous, just beautiful people? What are they? That's the first thing we see. But see, the older you get... And if you're a senior citizen, you already know this. That actually when you have relationships with people, what they look like has absolutely nothing to do with it. Or at least it should not. It's what the, what's on the inside that counts. I know you, that's trite. And you think, oh, oh, sure, I've heard of a million times. Well, that's probably because it's so true. Point number two. Most men act like they have no brain when they fall for a beautiful face and a great figure. And the guys know this, and the girls know it too. It's, it's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. I guess in high school is when this comes to, uh, to a place where it's so clear. When I was in high school, and I think it's probably still the same, even though I know that was ancient times. But then, one of the most important things in school was to what? Be popular. In order to be popular, some, some people had a great personality. Some people were good looking. Now, let me state this right off the bat. I don't think any guy is good looking, period. And now, some guys might be a little better looking than others, but all of them are relegated to the ash bin when it compares to the female. God made females absolutely beautiful. 
Uh, someone told me one time one reason that they're, uh, they're, they have a lot of beauty is something about their skin that there's a little, there's some kind of, I don't mean this is derogatory, but some kind of fat that's in there that makes their skin smoother. Women's skin are not the same as men's skin. And, and they're, they're just more lovely altogether. And in high school, I, I, of course, I wasn't a female, so I can't speak to this other than what I heard from females. But if you were really gorgeous, then you had no trouble getting a date, and guys would just look at you and fawn over you, and it just their beauty just opened up doors everywhere. They never worried about getting a date. They had to turn away guys all the time that were just slobbering all around them, just, uh, oh, you know, this is gorgeous you. They walk in a room and everybody sees them. Now, I think that probably beauty, real beauty like that, can be not an asset, but a burden. And here's one, one reason why. Because when you have everybody just getting out of your way and fawning over you and all this, it's hard to build character. It's very easy to depend on that beauty to get what you want. I don't know of any guy that can do that. Certainly wasn't me. I don't know who are the guys that I went with. We just couldn't care less. So when we're talking about beauty, um, females, and you have to be, by the way, drop dead gorgeous in order to do this. Women can take their beauty, their feminine form, and use it in a way that can be very dangerous. I don't think they understand the power that they have. And so when I made point number two, most men act like they have no brain when they fall for a beautiful face and figure is because of that charm, that power that women have. So we're talking about a problem here. We have Jacob choosing Rachel. And it just said in the verse that Leah, the older daughter, had weak eyes. And it says, where is it here? Uh, verse 17, and Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful, a farming face. Now, if it said then in verse 18, now Jacob loved Leah and wanted to marry her, that would be somewhat surprising, wouldn't it? I mean, this is altogether what you would expect. And most of the time, people get into relationships. A woman that is, I'm talking about unusually pretty, beautiful, causes problems. Oh, the guy likes to have her on, her, on his arm and strut about, look what I got. You know, this, and that attitude, even that, is destructive. He should love her for who she is, not her beauty. And I, I tell you this, some of the ugliest females I have ever known were drop-dead gorgeous. It takes a little time to figure that out. Some guys, it doesn't matter. A lot of people get married for beauty. And I guess it's... Ladies, you can tell me, I'm not sure, but I guess it goes the other way as well. I don't know how it does, but I guess... If some guy looks, see, here's the problem. If a guy looks really handsome, what they would call handsome, it gets to a point he no longer looks masculine, he looks feminine because he's too pretty. Does that make sense? So we don't have a chance. Not that there's many guys that fit that situation, that, that condition. Point number three. Men would be wise to choose a Proverbs 31 woman whether she is beautiful or not. Now, what is a Proverbs 31 woman? Well, those of you who know the Bible know that this is a believer, a Christian woman that is married, and, and you just read Proverbs 31, and you'll find that this is the epitome of what a wife should be like. The Proverbs 31 woman does not follow the world standard of feminine achievement. By the way, I'm, I'm just quoting R, Tom R. Hawkins from Biblia Seca Thacra, which is a theological journey, the journal. This is number 153, page 22. And this is what Tom says, or what he's quoted here. 
The Proverbs 31 woman does not follow the world standards of feminine achievement focused on physical beauty and womanly charm. I'm going to read that again because this is what so many people, and usually it's the younger females who want to compete with one another, uh, they think that achievement is focused on physical beauty and womanly charm. But not the Proverbs 31 woman, I go on and, and quote, he says, Instead, she has chosen to anchor her life on the fear of Yahweh, that is of God. That's verse 30, Proverbs 31, verse 30, the true basis of all wisdom. So, I guess I'll show you these verses on the screen for the sake of time. Here's Proverbs 31, 30. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. That's the number one quality right there. Does she fear the Lord? In other words, does she respect him? Does she live her life around pleasing the Lord and so forth? Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23 through 25. For the commandment is a lamp, and the teaching is light. Now, I'm going to stop there for just one moment. What do most people think, the average person, when they think of a commandment? They think, oh, it's something I have to do. A lot of people are rebellious. They're not grace-oriented, and they're not authority-oriented, and when you say the word command, they just bristle. They want to do what they want to do. They want to be free and independent. I don't need any of this garbage. Well, that's an idiot. What we have here, again, this is Proverbs 6, 23, for the commandment is a lamp. It enlightens, and the teaching is light. That's what the commandments are for. It's for our own good, for our well-being. That's the right attitude towards the commandment. I just thought I'd throw that in. Now, get it back on here. So, for the commandment is a lamp and the teaching is light, and reproofs for discipline are the way of life. We all make mistakes, and so we get reproved. That's how we learn. Verse 24. To keep you from the evil woman... From the smooth tongue of the adulteress, do not desire her beauty in your heart or let her catch you with her eyelids. Are you listening, guys? Hmm? What was I talking about a while ago? The power of a woman? I can't do it, but you know, when she looks at you and goes, like this. Oh, that's pitiful, isn't it? I mean, you know, she's had eyelashes and she's they know how to attract your attention. And I guess it's kind of like sending out radar or waves or something. A woman can just flip her hair. Or she can kind of look. You know, all, the, all these things are going on. And this is a warning to guys. Um, it's like, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm trying my best to show you. I look like an idiot up here trying to look like a woman. Uh, trying to track some guy. I can't do it, but you all know what I'm talking about. Sometimes it's just a look. Well, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to try to do any more. For right now, anyway. So verse 25 again. Do not desire her beauty in your heart. And that's what guys do. The way women dress and the way they walk I assume that there's different ways that you can walk, ladies. That one is just going into Walmart to go get the groceries or whatever, and the other one is when a guy is watching, and you have a little more sway to it, a little, you know, uh, whatever. And it says, don't let her beauty get into your heart. In other words, don't think about her. Don't start lusting after her. Don't slobber. Just yeah, that's a beautiful home. Now, everybody loves beauty, don't they? I mean, when a, a beautiful woman comes into a room, a lot of eyes turn. I, now, ladies, don't you like to see other beautiful women? Notice I said other. 
Emphasis on the other. Yeah, you like to look at them, but you don't want your husband looking, do you? But it's natural. And I think um, when this happens and you have your boyfriend or you have your husband there with him, and, and they look and they and, and you see that they're beauty and then you give him one of these in the ribs, that's really not necessary. Because it's natural for everyone to look at beauty. But now if it becomes a stare, then in the ribs. I don't mean literally, necessarily. Do not desire her beauty in your heart. That's what I'm talking about. Nor let her catch you with her eyelids. Okay, yeah. All right, here we go. Proverbs 11:22. As a ring of gold and a swine's snout, snout, so is a beautiful woman who lacks discretion. I'm, I'm just something just came made me think. There's some things that even though you have beauty, if you don't have discretion, in other words, if you're a loud mouth biddy, and that's a euphemism for what some people may say, and it's it's like you can put a ring in the snout of a hog, but doesn't make them be pretty, does it? Doesn't make them beautiful. And beauty can't make a woman beautiful because if she is um, not a Proverbs 31 woman, then you can forget it. Now I'm going to set this up here. Ezekiel chapter 16 verses 1 through 14. <coughs> Excuse me is a parable, actually it's not so much a parable as a, the whole thing is a metaphor, about how Israel was metaphorically, there's the, there it is, the metaphor, abandoned after birth and thrown out naked into a field. Now that's, I want to go ahead and start turning to Ezekiel chapter 16. Put a, put a marker in verse, I mean in Genesis 28. And we go, want to go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel's right after Jeremiah. Ezekiel chapter 16. And we're going to start in verse 15, but I'm, I'm setting this up for you. So in this metaphor, in this narrative that is being given, starting with Ezekiel 16.1, God is giving, actually it's a Moral genealogy, not a physical uh, genealogy. And he talks about Israel being born and being naked and just taken and thrown out into a field. And it's, it, it's, it's normally they would, with, with a child, they would uh, wash it and uh, take care of it, clothe it, and all that. And he, what God is doing is saying, in your birth, you acted as if you were, um, morally speaking, just like uh, a person who has been born and thrown out into the field. But then God came along and clothed her, adorned her with jewelry. She became exceedingly beautiful and famous. That's what's happened. I guess I should have just read one, uh, 1 through 16, probably been shorter than, or about the same as me explaining it to you. But you have to have that in your thinking to start to understand verse 15. So here you have Israel that was just abandoned, had nothing. God comes along, clothes her, gives her jewelry, makes her beautiful. This might be analogous to when he uh, gave them the tabernacle or maybe the temple and all the worship was going on and so forth. At, at that point, she was beautiful <clears throat> and even famous. But then we get to verse 15. Are y'all in Ezekiel 16, 15? What's the first word? Uh-huh, but, underline that. This, is, this always is the case. It was da 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 It was good, it was wonderful. All God did all these things, but... So Ezekiel 16, 15, but you trusted in your beauty and played the harlot because of your fame 
and you poured out your harlotries on every passerby who might be willing. Now, I was thinking about reading from verse 15 all the way down to verse 34. And let me tell you, gird up your loins because it is shocking what is going on there. To the point to where I... Let's see, should I read this or not? Read it with you. I guess I will because you're going to be wondering what it's about. But I'm not going to do any explanation. There's probably enough explanation there already. You think that we are bad in America today, culturally, socially, and so forth, and we are. I'll just read on. Now, remember, the whole point is that she was beautiful. God made her beautiful. Then you have the but. She got arrogant. She, she, she was famous. And then she turned to idols, harlotry. That's spiritual uh, adultery here. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then you have verse 16. And you took some of your clothes and made for yourself high places of various colors and played the harlot on them, which should never have come about nor happen. High places is where all the pagan rituals and all the pagan things happen. A lot of times you'll see in the Bible it's talking about in the, on the high places. That's where the idolatry, the fornication, all these orgies, all these kind of things happen on the high places. <clears throat> Verse 18. Then you took your embroidered cloth and covered them and offered my all and my incense for them. Oh, wait. I, I skipped chapter, se I mean, verse 17, didn't I? Okay, here's verse 17. You also took your beautiful jewels and made of my gold and my silver which I had given you and made for yourself male images that you may play the harlot with them. That is despicable. Uh, they were fornicating with these idols that they made out of the gold and silver that God blessed them with. Verse 18. Then you took your embroidery cloth and covered them and offered my all and my incense before them. Do you understand how despicable this is? Verse 19. Also, my bread which I gave you, fine flour, all, and honey, with which I fed you, you would offer before them for a soothing aroma, as it happened, declares the Lord God. Moreover, verse 20. You took your sons and daughters whom you had born to me, and you sacrifice them to idols to be devoured where your harlotries were your harlotries such a small matter? In other words, they sacrificed their children to these idols. Verse 21, you slaughtered my children and offered them up to idols by causing them to pass through the fire. This is simply a, a, a idol called Moloch. And they was, it was empty in, in the bottom part, and it would fire go up, and there's this big pan he's holding, big plate-looking thing, and it would get sizzling hot, and they would take their children, and they would throw them on this sizzling hot thing, and as the children were screaming and hollering, they were fornicating, it just made it more exciting to them. That's how despicable this was. I mean, I know, it shakes your head. This is coming from the Bible, so it can get that bad. This is what they've done. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 22, And besides all your abomination and harlotries, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare and squirming in your blood. That's what it describes in the first 14 verses, <clears throat> how they were born. They came out of this, and God took them that had, this is how they were described, and made them beautiful and famous and blessed. And then, then you have the but. Verse 23, then it came about, all of your, after all your wickedness, woe, woe to you, declares the Lord, that you built yourself a shrine and made yourself a high place in every square. This means all the places, all the intersections where the streets came together and everything, they would have these high places and these uh, shrines. Verse 25, you, you built yourself a high place at the top of every street and made your beauty, there's your beauty again, at, at the top of every street and made your beauty abominable. You spread your legs to every passerby to multiply your harlotry. You also played the harlot with the Egyptians 
your lustful neighbors and multiplied your harlotry to make me angry. So it spread to the, they did it before the Egyptians as well, verse 27. Behold, now I have stretched out my hand against you and diminished your rations. He did that to get their attention and I delivered you up to the desire of those who hate you, the daughters of the Philistines who are ashamed of you, of your lewd, lewd, uh, lewd conduct. In other words, their enemies were the Phil, uh, Philippians, uh, excuse me, the Philistines, and they were their enemies, and they were ashamed of these God's people. It says here, uh, and the daughters of the Philistines who are ashamed of your lewd conduct. Now, when your enemy is ashamed of uh, of you for how immoral you are, that's bad. Verse 28. Moreover, you played the harlot with the Assyrians because you were not satisfied. You even played the harlot with them and still were not satisfied. You also multiplied your harlotry with the land of the merchants in Chaldea. Yet even with this, you are not satisfied. That's the problem. Once you get something that controls you, you can never be satisfied. Verse 30. How languishing is your heart, declares the Lord God, while you do all these things, the actions of a bold-faced harlot, when you built your shrine at the beginning of every street and made your high places in every square in disdaining money, you were not like a harlot. They weren't doing this for money. It was just they were consumed by their lust. Verse 32. You adulterous wife who takes strangers instead of your husband, her husband, men gave gifts to all harlots but you give your gifts to all your lovers to bribe them to come to you for every uh, direction, for every uh, direction of your, from every direction from your hearts. In other words, of course, men would pay harlots, but they were so debased that they would pay men just to have sex with them. Verse 34, thus you are different from those women in your harlotries in that no one plays the harlot as you do, because you give money and do not, and no money is given you, thus you are different. Now that's just a short piece of what goes on when you are consumed and you no longer are thinking about God. He's, he's just, you, you, you can be absolutely consumed. And beauty had a big part to play in that. <clears throat> So, here's the, here's the issue. Don't be captivated by beauty. That's all in bold letters in my notes. Why? Why should not be captivated by it? Because it does not last. It never does. Beauty doesn't last. It always fades. What does it take for that to happen? Time. Now, there are People, there's women in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and even in their 90s that are still attractive. And we have a huge example of that here in this church. It's not that they are not attractive. They're very attractive. But they're not as attractive as they were when they were in high school or maybe college. And it fades. And another thing about beauty I didn't put this, it just came into my mind. If you're going to make a relationship on beauty because you are just captivated by someone's beauty and you haven't really seen the real person on the inside, what's going to happen is there's always someone that's going to come along that's prettier. There's always someone more beautiful. And, for, and that goes both ways. I'm talking about for the men or the women. If, you, if, you, if that's one of your main things, then it's not going to last. It's... it's, it's just not going to happen. Turn to First Peter chapter twenty-four, verse twenty-five. First Peter, chapter twenty-four. Oh, excuse me, chapter one, verse twenty-four. First Peter, chapter one, verse twenty-four. This is a, all. This is about beauty. Boy, I have so much more I want to get to, but I'm going to sift this down to the bottom because it's a huge problem with people. They kind of worship at the shrine of beauty. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24. I, 
just said that beauty doesn't last, it fades. First Peter 1 Peter 1.24, all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off or fades, but the word of the Lord abides forever. That's what's important. And it always fades. It will always fade. By the way, women, most women put on makeup to even enhance their beauty. And some guys, but well, back in the dark ages when I was dating, uh, I always saw the girls looking all, you know, all made up, their hair was all, everything was great. But I went to one girl's house one time. She didn't know I was coming. That's, that's, that's broke that rule already. And uh, she opened the door, and back then they used to have curves in their hair. And she had all these round things all in her hair. Well, it didn't bother me, but she freaked out. She slammed the door, and I heard her hair screaming, running through the house. Because I actually saw her, what she would really look like. I saw them in there at one time, these pictures of women who are drop-dead gorgeous when they're all made up, and then they show them around the house. Ugh. I'm going to get in trouble. I better move on. Okay, turn to Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 8. We're going to start in we're going to start in verse 8. We're again talking about this time Jerusalem verse 8 For Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen because their speech and their actions are against the Lord to rebel against his glorious presence. Now, we're running low on time. <clears throat> I wanted to pick it up. Let's see. Let's just go to verse 16. I'm, I'm running low on time. I was going to read from 8 all the way to 26, but we'll just start at verse 16 here. Moreover, the Lord said, Because the... Daughters of Zion are proud and walk with their heads held high and seductive eyes and go along with mincing steps and tinkle the bang, uh, bangles on their feet. Now, I guess I have to stop and explain that a little bit. This is talking about the daughters of Zion. And it says uh, they are proud. And that means arrogant here. And they walk with their heads, heads held high, which is fine. I mean, you want to have good posture and all, but this is, I think, nose in the air. And seductive eyes, and go along with men, mincing steps, and tinkle the bangles on their feet. So they would have little bells on their feet, and they would have uh, seductive eyes, and they were head their head held high. So when they're walking down the street, I, uh, anyway, you know they're they're. Um, well, I can't do it. You you can just see it. I mean, uh, they're very proud of what they look like, and 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 so much so they're advertising. I mean, when they come walking down the street, you hear the bells. What's that? Oh, wow! Look at that. You know, that's what they, that's the act, the uh, reaction they want to have because they're arrogant. They're depending on their beauty. Verse 17, therefore the Lord will afflict, uh, and remember verse 8, they had, because their speech and their actions are against the Lord. That's why I, verse, I did verse 8. By the time you get to verse 16, it describes them, uh, <clears throat> and now we're going to see what the Lord's going to do about it. Verse 17, therefore the Lord will afflict the scalp of the daughters of Zion with scabs, and the Lord will make their foreheads bare. In that day, the Lord will take away the beauty of her anklets. Is that right, anklets? Yeah. yeah. Headbands, crescent ornaments, dangling earrings, 
bracelets, veils, headdresses, ankle chains, sashes, perfume boxes, amulets, finger rings, nose rings, festal robes, outer tunics, cloaks, money purses, hand mirrors, undergarments, turnets, uh, uh, turbans, and veils. He's going to take all that away. I bet these women freaked out. Huh? I mean, that's a pretty exhaustive list, isn't it? I mean, some sometimes now, um, I know one time uh, Carrie was asking me where her foundation was. I said, well, it's back there under the house. She says, no, I'm talking about some kind of makeup stuff. Um, even if you don't have a foundation for women, it, uh, evidently that's something of concern, whatever that is. But if you take away all these things, I believe that would get a woman's attention, don't you? I bet it took them a long time to get dressed. Verse 24. Now it will come about that instead of sweet perfume, there will be future, future fraction. Future refraction. Future fraction. All right, that's the best I can get. Stinks. Instead of a belt, a rope. Instead of a well-set hair, a plucked-out scalp. Instead of fine clothes, a donning of sackcloth. sackcloth and branding instead of beauty, your men will fall by the sword and your mighty ones in battle, and her gates will lament and mourn, and deserted she will sit on the ground. Am I getting across what the Bible thinks about people who have been given something that's a gift? Listen, none of us could filled out a form and said, when we're born, this is what we want to be like. Did we? We had nothing to say on it. And so with women, when they're, they're beautiful and they know how to use that beauty, then what did they do to get it? Why are they so pompous and proud? Like, look at me. Boy, I'm really something. No, God is something. You just happen to be one that had the genes come together and uh, you're, well, you turn out beautiful. What does that mean? Nothing. And that's the way people ought to look at if they have an advantage like that, instead of being so proud and putting bells on your uh, ankles and all this other gear and walking around and sashaying and uh, getting everybody's attention. They're thinking about who or whom? Themselves. What we ought to do is be thanking God that uh, we didn't turn out to be a... Well, I was going to say something. It's politically incorrect, but you're wondering what it's going to say. And, a midget. Now, this is no, I don't mean any harm to the midgets. I just said it's not your fault that you are a midget. And we should, is that the right term, by the way? Do they call them little people or what? I don't know. I'm, I'm not trying to be politically correct. I'm just making sure that if some midget hears this, that he doesn't think I'm in despairing him. Because they're just as good as we are. They're just... You, know, well, you understand I'm getting deeper in the pit. I'll quit digging. <coughs> Trying to First Peter chapter 3. We're talking about beauty and women. And we have it here in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, <clears throat> that might be the gospel, they're unbelievers, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. So let's say you were an unbeliever when you got married, and then the wife became a believer, the husband is still an unbeliever, <coughs> excuse me, you're not to preach at him, you're not to try to bring him around with all the uh, ways of to 
encourage him or to bring him around to where you think he ought to be. Forget that. It's your behavior. So that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. That's showing respect. That's being the uh, Proverbs 31 wife, verse 2. And they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Underline respectful there. <clears throat> even though their husband isn't a believer, even though their husband may be making a, a decision that she doesn't agree with, she respects his authority and she obeys him. Why? Because God commanded it. And she knows that if she obeys her husband, even when she doesn't agree with him, God is going to bless her because she's obeying him. Verse, let's see, 3. And let not your adornment be merely, under, well, mine is merely is in italics. It's not there. But it says, and let not your adornment be merely external, braided, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses. Well, I assume all of them have to do that anyway, but I guess... Uh, it's, it's, and it goes on to say, verse 4, But let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of God. So there's nothing wrong with uh, braiding, braiding the hair and wearing of gold jewelry <clears throat> or putting on dresses. I mean, obviously, that's what they all have to do. We need to be dressed. It's talking about using that to get your way and to think that you're superior to others by the way you look, by your beauty, and all that type of thing. It says, no, let it be the hidden person of the heart. It's what you think. It's your relationship with the Lord, which is an imperishable quality of a gentle, quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. I wonder if you went to some of these um, feminist marches and you said, can I just have the microphone for one minute? Okay. And you read this, you'd be attacked. No doubt about it. You'd come off that stage bloodied. Verse 5. For in this way, in former times, holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Now, notice it's something they do, not something they wear, not something they put on. It's who, who they are inside their soul. And then verse 6, the Sarah, y'all remember Sarah, don't you? What was her name one time, before, what it was before Sarah? Sarai. Oh, y'all are good. Yeah, Sarai. But it says, the Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children, if you do, do what is right without being frightened by any fear. Now, that's kind of odd. Uh, I've I got to really bring this to a close. But that's kind of, what, what, be all on board till you get there and it says, it mentions fear. Look at that last verse again. Sarah has believed her husband, calling him Lord, and you have become her children. If you do what is right, that's first of all, then it says, without being frightened by any fear. Why is fear interjected there? I think it's there because I, one reason I think so many women do not obey their husbands when they ought to is because they're afraid. They're afraid if they go along with him, uh, and maybe they're right, maybe they have a better idea, and where the husband is going isn't good, it might cause problems and so forth, and they have talk to their husbands, try to lead them in this direction what they think is the right way, and they say, nope, we're going to do it this way. It's the fear of having to take over and not trusting the Lord in that situation, why they take over and rebel against Him and sometimes just flat out disobey their husbands. It's out of fear. And the reason it's fear is because they don't trust the Lord enough where He says, to obey your husband, submit to him, and when you do that, you're obeying him and you're absolutely going to be blessed. It doesn't matter what brain, uh, hair brain that scheme he's got or whatever it is, that doesn't matter. What matters for the wife is when she obeys her husband, no matter what else happens, she will be blessed. That's why the fear is there. 
because women think, I have to take over. I have to take it into my own grasp because this is going to be a disaster. No. You obey your husband. Remember what it says uh, earlier about uh, the woman that's not what she says, it's what she do, does with her chaste and humble uh, attitude. So that's, that should be huge. Remember this, ladies, that the Lord is going to bless you when you obey Him. And sometimes that's hard to do. But if you just try it and do it and say, okay, husband, I don't agree with what you're, you're saying and I think it's going to be a disaster. But I'm going to be on board. I'm going to obey you and we'll, we'll go through this together. And I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it because the Lord commands me to do it and I'm expressing, expecting blessing out of this. Unfortunately, you're going to get something else. You understand? Especially if they're overbearing and sound like a drill sergeant or something. Okay, well, we're past time. Isn't Genesis 29 fun? Huh? Well, sometimes it is. When we're going in Ezekiel, uh, what was it, uh, 16? Yeah, that was rough. And by the way, I, I, I hope that you recognize that's where we're headed. We're already well on our way. Uh, last Sunday I talked about uh, Tony Perkins uh, had a, a, a blurb in his article about, uh, what was it, a nine or ten year old boy that went to Beto or Rourke's a rally and he goes out there, they give him the microphone and he says, I just want to uh, say that I'm, I'm coming out, uh, that I'm gay and I wanted to do it here. And what was the audiences? They applauded and started chanting, love is love. Like uh, That's where we are today. And I, those of us that are old enough to know when we were much more on a solid moral footing are absolutely shocked. Sometimes do you ever wonder when you read things in the Bible, how could those people allow that to happen? Especially in the Old Testament, well, New Testament too. How could they be so stupid? How could they let that happen? Well, now we're beginning to see, aren't we? Because we are turning into who they were. Well, the last portion of this service is for those who uh, are completely un... The, the future is completely unknown to them. They have no clue what's going to happen when they breathe their last. And so the good news is that you don't have to be concerned because Jesus Christ the Son of God went to the cross. On that cross, He died for your sins, my sins, the sins of the world. And then He was buried, but of course, nothing could keep Him in the grave. For three days and three nights, He arose, and now He offers eternal life as a gift. It's the only way you can get it is as a gift for anyone who will trust Him and Him alone for eternal salvation. That's how you receive the gift, is by believing the promise of God. When you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and what He did for you on the cross and nothing else, in that moment you're born again, you become a royal family member of the Most High, your ticket to heaven is guaranteed, and you have the option, you have the possibility of living the abundant life. And I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about something much more precious than that and stable. Now, Heavenly Father, we thank You for this time that we could go through these verses. How instructive are they to us if we have ears to hear, we are shocked by what happened then. We ought to be shocked by what's happening now. But we don't have to fear because we have your promises. We have the faith rest drill. We have Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. We have so many things that we can rely on. We're thankful for that. So we pray that you will help us to meditate on these things. Think about them and adjust and adapt our life to where we'll be more pleasing in your sight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thursday. Oh yeah, and don't forget, no Bible class uh, Tuesday. It's in your bulletin.